can't let a, a lead go cold too long. Otherwise, they're going to switch to another project, another architect. Business of Architecture, episode 351. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that lets you do your best work more often. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, business of architecture step-by-step program for firm owners that helps you structure your practice for creative and financial success, both for you and your team. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. What is it like to be on the business development team of a world-class design firm like the Office of Metropolitan Architecture, otherwise known as OMA, the firm founded by Rem Coolhouse? Today, I speak with the former business development manager of OMA's Hong Kong office, Viviano Villarreal Buron. Viviano has since launched his own successful architecture firm, Mass Operations, based in Monterrey, Mexico. Today, we talk about how to get business development done as a busy architect running a small practice. Viviana, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Hi, Anna. Great to be here with you and with all your audience. Absolutely. So, so good to have you. One of the things that, we often, that I oftentimes hear in our work with architecture firms is the difficulty between balancing the business development with the PR, with the work, with the design, everything that happens. So a lot of times that just falls to the end of the list. Yeah, and I think it doesn't uh, it, it doesn't acquire as much as respect as it as it needs to, and I think it also is not taught at all in our in our academic backgrounds when we were learning to become architects. There's no PR class, and there's there's some instincts of teaching what professional practice courses are, but it really doesn't teach you anything that has to do with the business side as business development. Uh, what an RFP is, what an RFQ is, uh, pitfalls, what to look out for, and all these kind of things that you really learn on the fly, on the work, on on the job. And, you know, the division between all these different, let's say, activities, business development, uh, PR, etc. cetera, uh, when it's a huge firm, there's departments for that. But if you're starting out with your own practice, there's one person only, for the whole thing, right? So it's very important to be able to divide and split your work in the smartest way possible. And it's hard. It's not easy. And there's really no guidelines for it. So how, how do you do it? <laughs> so what's what's the magic formula? I can, I can tell you what I learned uh, insofar as first getting into business development. Uh, I first got into business development through design. And it was an opportunity that I had while I was working at OMA. Uh, the business developer there uh, met, decided to quit. And I thought I could learn a lot from that role, taking up that role. Now, this was in Hong Kong. And of course, it involved learning from, let's say, first, all the lingo, all the acronyms of business development, RFP, RFQ, RFI, all these kind of things, getting into contracts, of course. Now, so that was sort of my upbringing in the business side of the architectural world. Starting my own office, um, you have to manage all at the same time. So the way that I've found is the, the most advantageous or the, the, the one that works the best is not to be reactive. I think mostly we are reactive. And that means, uh, so there's active BD and there's reactive BD. And I think reactive BD has a lot to do with uh, client relationships and, and kind of maintaining those and fostering new client relationships, which is the key part of business development, of course. But if you're only reacting to business development. And an an example, just to kind of state the most basic one would be getting an email for a quote for a project, right? And okay, so you have to come up with a sort of a proposal of how your fees work, analyze a project, understand how you're going to charge for that project and sending out that fee proposal with a little bit of your portfolio that is handpicked and selected according to what that project entails, right? Uh, But that's just a reaction. And, you know, out of if in design we say that we win one out of 10 competitions and out of each win, one out of 10 gets built, you know, it's probably the same in, in fee proposals for the business side. So the other aspect is um, to be doing active business development. And one thing that we do here is that once a month, we look back at our different business development hours. Where have we been? We have this nice little diagram, which has 
coffee being poured in into different cups. And those cups are residential projects, uh, commercial projects, uh, speculation projects. Like, so where has that coffee been placed? And then we analyze how much money have we made from those projects. So then we can identify a couple of things where we're not putting any hours. So maybe we should look out more cultural projects. Who are the players in cultural development out there? Call calls, call emails. Those are never really recommended. But then before getting to the cold call or call email, try to find if you have in our network, someone that we know that could be sort of a bridge to that contact with that person. So they just get to know you, right? Uh, and that's active BD, that kind of thing. Those lists of people that you want to target and really thoughtful lists. It's not just like grabbing the list of developers. Like, no, which type of developer, which type of people could potentially be good fit clients for you? I think doing that once a month has really allowed us to kind of keep a steady flow of potentials. And again, potentials are not guaranteed, but at least you have that list of potentials and we can track where we have we be spending our hours in pre-contractual work. And that's all about just trying to get those clients. There's no fee yet, but it's potential projects. Viviana, you're, you're trained as an architect. Mm-hmm. You, you are an architect. How do you keep from focusing on the things that you may be most comfortable with? In other words, the architecture, the design. How do you have the discipline to make sure that the BD is happening? Now, I don't know if it comes easily for you. For a lot of architects, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think I struggled too much with it, but I don't necessarily love it. Uh, you know, nobody likes giving a cold call or, or, or writing or drafting a cold email. It's horrible. So that's always the last resort. And actually, it almost never pays off. So not recommended. So the question is, how do I, how do I manage myself between going to these realms, which I don't feel that comfortable in? Uh, maybe because I do feel comfortable in them. That's not where I'd rather spend my time, but I don't struggle with it personally. Um, I think the aspect of PR and BD, I'm quite okay with it. When I was coming up in the ranks in design, I could feel the animosity of other colleagues of mine who are design-oriented as I am, who wanted to have nothing to do with the topic. But for me, what makes me be okay with it and, want, and, and makes me want to be better at it is that I understood very early on that that's the path to getting potential projects. And an office without projects is not really an office. There's other ways. You don't have to become a BD expert or connoisseur of getting work, of course. There's other ways. But there are harder and fewer apart. And they don't provide what, I, what is... Um, uh, stable work, let's say. It's very erratic. Even though within a normal working environment where, where you have a good BD department, it's also very erratic. You know, economies go up and down. Projects get canceled all the time. So in that sense, I think me realizing how important it is to have a successful office with good clients and good projects made me just, you know, uh, understand that's how it works. Got it. And how do you make sure that it actually happens instead of being something that you want to do, but you never get around to doing it? Do you schedule time every week to work on it? Is it just so important to you that you make time for it? Yes. Uh, well, like I said, once a month, I check where have we been spending these hours, which are unbuilt. You know, every unbuilt, I mean, no billing, no fees, not unbuilt. Um, that's my little accent, I guess. So once a month, I do that, you know, religiously to check that. However, within the checklist of every day and every week, there's a little box that says BD. And I see every day all the people that I have not kind of checked back in with. So, you know, you have to keep these things uh, relevant. And what I mean relevant is that you can't let a a lead go cold too long. Otherwise, they're going to switch to another project, another architect. This happened to me uh, several times. You know, we come in with a developer. They're excited to work with us. We do what is called a feasibility study. They love the project. Then they go and kind of try to get the financing for the project. A year goes by. They forget about you. Meanwhile, they've developed relationships with other five architects, which they also like. And guess what? Who ends up with the project? One of the new relationships. So you need to become relevant. And you need to check in with your with these leads that you have, these different potential clients, constantly, not overwhelmingly, and not always to check up on the lead. Sometimes you need to just invite them to an event, 
uh, let them know of a, a, a project that they could be interested in that has nothing involved with you. So these sort of um, alternatives of just coming back into their radar, not necessarily with the question of like, hey, so how's that project that we did a pitch for you, you know, a couple of months ago, I think is very important. And you know what? What's actually a goldmine of that little nugget is that most often what happens in those check-ins, they're like, you know, we know that uh, we haven't moved on X or Y project, but, you know, actually we've got a new lead that we're looking into, into this and this, and that's a new project. And perhaps there's a few hours set into that that will be pre-contract, but hey, it's another lead, right? And you're still being relevant. You're still in that <clears throat> developer's um, immediate sphere of, let's say, uh, interaction. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. How do you handle it when... Say, for instance, you you want to reach out to someone. Maybe there's someone who actually already knows you, and maybe you feel that they just don't want to get together for a chat. In other words, they're busy. Why would they speak to you? Any favorite approaches that you do to actually get people on the phone to be able to take the relationship to the next level? Yeah, I think, well, it's a couple of ones that I mentioned. I think sometimes you just need to uh, spend bullets because something that I hate is that, and you know, as an architect, we get a lot of people calling us to get work from us as well. So we're, we're potential work for a lot of uh, different, uh, let's call it disciplines and industries, you know, interior designers, uh, people that sell furniture, people that sell architectural uh, finishes, et cetera, et cetera. So they are doing their cold calling and kind of reaching out to you as well. And you're like, look, there's no project right now, but you need to kind of receive them and give them the time. And those calls and those meetings can take up quite a chunk of your time, which is precious if you need to design something to get it out there so you can get your fee for that design, right? However, what I mean by spending bullets is that you need to really sometimes think of something that your potential client could be interested in that has nothing to do with you, you know? Quick email, hey, I thought this would be interesting for you. Have you seen that this plot of land is up for sale? Blah, 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 send it their way. And it doesn't mean like I want to design it with you, et cetera, et cetera. It's just something that that they say, oh, look, Viviana is reaching out with this thing, but he's not asking about the project. So it's also because every time you check in to ask about the project, it sounds like you need work. And that's never nice. But, you know, it's a reality of our business. And so when you send something their way that has nothing to do where you have nothing to gain from, I think it's a good way to just check back in. Now, setting up time to discuss stuff, you can say, look, I've got this project. I've done this a couple of times where I'm going to buy this piece of land and design for it, but I don't have a developer for it. So perhaps I could take five minutes of your time for you to look at the formula of how much the land is worth, how much I'm putting in as kind of design and and construction fees. And if you can tell me your opinion, if you think this is a good place to, to invest, this has nothing to do with you making money off of them. And this has nothing to do with the project that you've done a feasibility study for them. So it's a completely separate topic. And perhaps you could check in at some point in that conversation, like how our project's doing, et cetera. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a tactful thing. And tact is a very difficult thing. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.